Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. Well, if summer keeps along like it's been the first couple of days of June, I think we're in for a wonderful time. You know, we've had some rain and it hadn't been too hot and um, everything in the garden just looks wonderful. But, um, you know, I have a feeling it may change. It is South Carolina. But you know what? We're going to have a good time gardening no matter what. And I'm Amanda McNulty with Clips and Extension, and I hope we're going to have a real good time tonight. We're so glad you could join us for SCE TV's Making It Grow. We're coming to you live from historic downtown Sumter, a beautiful city. We're so happy to be here and happy that you're with us tonight. Jolie Elizabeth Brown is filling in for Teresa Lott. And as soon as we go inside, she'll remind you how easy it is to be a chatter. And I think she and Teresa have a little thing going about who's going to have the most chatters. So um, let's see if we can get a little competition going there. It's always fun in the chat room. Making it grow has fun. We get to visit wonderful places in South Carolina and meet wonderful people. We went down to Trident Technical College um, right near Charleston and visited the remarkable horticulture program there. You're going to be very impressed with the information that they're giving to the students who are there with them. Of course, Dr. John Nelson, our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina and head of the AC Moore Herbarium. There he is, Dr. John in person, will be with us with a puzzling mystery plant. But you know what? We've got two real smart people here tonight. Um, my dear friend Suzanne Holmes, who retired from Extension, is with us, and she brought a super duper nurseryman from her hometown area with her. So we're going to have it nailed. So let's go inside and get this show started. This is Jolie Elizabeth Brown, who is um, a person who can do all kinds of things. And she, when she's in King Street in Williamsburg County, she's doing a great 4-H program. We're real proud of you, Jolie. And then when you're up here with us in Sumter, you're working on stormwater. And, um, and part of that is um, not letting things get washed down into the streams. And I think you've got um, a little litter uh, um, cleanup coming up, don't you? I do, Amanda. I would love for anyone interested in the Sumter area to join us this Saturday, June 7th from 10 to noon. We will be working off of Winston Road in Sumter, and that's located off of Highway 15 South. And we would love to have anyone join us. And Julie, I bet you have gloves and um, vests and things. And if somebody wants information, they could call the Sumter County office, mm -hmm. I think, and find out um, a little more if they needed to. Yeah. Now tell us how we can, we've got to get this competition going. <laughs> well, anyone who would like to join me tonight, I'd love to chat with you. It's very easy to do. Go to the Making It Grow Facebook page, scroll down a little bit, and click Let's Talk. You can sign in using your Facebook account or create a Rumble Talk account. Once you're in there, this is what the chat room looks like. As you can see, we have seven speakers already and I'm starting great conversations. If you have any questions, please join us. Do remember if you're using your smartphone tonight, be sure and use your favorite browser and not the Facebook app. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you so much and it's with great pleasure that I welcome my old college bud, <laughs> Suzanne Holmes. Um, I was a non-traditional student. You were very, very young, and now we are both about the same. <laughs> yeah, we're about the same. Yeah, that's and true. Suzanne, you retired from, retired from Clemson after a wonderful 
wonderful mm -hmm. career. And what are you doing now? I'm working at the University of Georgia part time as their horticulture program assistant. Right so across the river? It's right across the river in Augusta. Um, so I'm having a good time over there doing the same thing I've always done. I call it talking all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm good at that. Answering questions. That's what we Answering do. Questions. We give yeah. research based information so that people can make the right decision when they've got a problem. I don't. do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. And it's fun. Well, Most I'm time. so glad that you stopped yeah. by and brought your dear friend. Yeah. And I'm going to let you introduce him since you know him so much better than I do. This is Gerald Stevens, and he is uh, the co-owner of Nurseries Carolina over in North Augusta, South Carolina. And I have known Gerald for many years now. and He's, he's prematurely white-headed. Yes, he is. He <laughs> I is. don't know about that. <laughs> and he runs their garden center, and I'll let you tell. Then he has the other owner, and he is his brother, yeah, Ted. Tell us about what Ted is up to. Well, Ted's, um, he hides from the retail, but he loves new plants, and that's his forte. I call him the plant nut, and um, he really know, he really has brought a lot of very unusual plants to our our part of the I mean, country. He travels to Japan very a lot. Uh, he's gone to England and got a lot of stuff from England, but he has some real Japanese friends that are the, some of the top Japanese nurserymen, and uh, they've made very good friends and uh, when he goes to Japan they just go all over and find oh, all these new things and uh, he, they just have a good time. And then we can come and visit you and find them there. Right and we've got some of the product of that. Well, that's, uh, a lot of the product We are of that. very very happy that you're here with well, us thank today. You. Thank you so much for coming. And um, of course it wouldn't be making it grow if we didn't have Dr. John Nelson at the University of South Carolina where John is the curator of the AC Moore Herbarium and occasionally takes people on Devout Linnaeus field trips. And John, um, we, um, I know you're going to have a mystery plant in a little bit, but we get people who are always thinking that we can tell them what something is, and often we have to send those pictures and queries to you. And you provide a wonderful service for people in South Carolina. If they would like to um, send an image or get a plant to you, what's the best way to do that? <coughs> well, it's, it's uh, very simple, Amanda. All one has to do is send me an image um, as an a, a email attachment, I get these all the time, send it to my email address. Or you could call me up if you need further instructions about that. And um, one of the ways that people get plants to me is to drop them by <clears throat> if they happen to be in the Columbia area. Or I'll, if you want to, you can drive into the parking area downstairs and I'll run down and see what you've got. Now, do you act like those car hops who have um, roller skates on and roller skate out there? And, and I have a little cap that I put on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, however you are dressed, I know it's wonderful. And did you find a good place to go botanizing after you came down and helped us out the other day here at the station? You know, I, um, I ended up going through the beautiful town of Boykin. Oh. Well, um, there are many, many um, wonderful things in that part of the world, and I know you, you probably found a couple of them. Well, we'll, oh, yeah. be, we'll be back a little later for a mystery plant, and we thank you so much for being part of our program, John. Oh, well, thank you very much. Okay. And we've got a call already. Larry's calling us from Langley, South Carolina. Larry, thanks for calling us up tonight, and what can we do to help you with your landscape? Yes, uh, I got a little garden. I got 54 tomato plants. 54? I got some bell peppers and That's not banana good. peppers. Uh -huh. And uh, I start the garden out with uh, worm castings. The garden is beautiful, but mm. I don't hardly, I got about 12 tomatoes on the plants. They're probably about five feet high. Mm. And this time of the year, normally I have about 35 tomatoes on the plants. And I see one poor little bee out there. And that's all I see is just one little bee. Uh, do you think that the uh, all this ice storm we had maybe killed out a lot of the bees, or is other people have an issue with the bees, or what? My goodness. Well, we always have worries about our pollinators. Tomatoes, actually, um, I think the wind can actually right. spread the pollen for those, although a bee, I think, can make it more um, exciting for everybody. Um, but do you think it's because we've had so much rain and cooler weather, perhaps, Cheryl? I think it's cool nights. Uh, have slowed down pollination on them, but I think it'll come. They don't need the, the they don't need the bees. Um, the squash and cucumbers and things like that will, but mm -hmm. the um, tomatoes, they are um, not wind pollinated, but 
Well, they're self. It, it is yeah. they, actually the wind does kind of right. have to brush them a little bit. Right. I think there's a little bit of that that goes right. on. Right, but I think it's just cool nights. Yeah, and Amanda, I haven't talked to any of the beekeepers. I, I used to see a lot of them, so I'm not sure his I question. Yeah. If uh -huh. there if there has been some um, harm to them from our cold weather, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, one thing I think we can always do, and I think it makes the garden pretty, is to have blooming plants in the garden all the time. So I like to leave. Um, if my collards go to bolt and things, instead of cutting down. My lettuce is going to bolt and but it's it, it'll beautiful. But it will bring pollinators, won't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it will. It yeah. Will. Okay. Well, thank you. And we hope that soon you will be eating one of those delicious um, tomato sandwiches that we all love so much in South Carolina. All righty. Our next caller is Conway, which sounds like a place that you could live, but this is a person's name. And Conway lives in Spartanburg. Conway, thank you for calling us. And um, anything puzzling going on up your way? I, I'm sorry, Amanda, I, I couldn't quite hear you. Well, I said, first of all, thank you for calling us, and what can we do, may, can, may, we hope we can help you tonight. What's your question? Okay. Uh, Amanda, I have a collection of oak leaf hydrangeas. Oh. They're uh, about, uh, about 20, at least 20 plants, and they're between six and eight years old. Uh, last year, one of the plants uh, looked like it had wilt. It collapsed, and it died. I replaced it. It died. This Now, I look and I, around this tree that I have, uh, about three or four of them show the same symptoms. Ooh. There's no sign of uh, insect damage, there's no fungus, nothing, no clue as to what's going on. The whole plant just seems to collapse, even when it's in bloom. Now, some of them in bloom and they collapse. Ooh. Well, let me see if we can get some ideas. Um, I've seen on hydrangeas, um, what's the little ambrosia, tiny, ambrosia beetle? beetle. Mm -hmm. Now, they are so small, you may not see them. But uh, where they are collapsed, and see if it breaks off, and, um, and look and see if there's maybe little tiny holes uh, about the size of a pinhead. Um, and just look for that. I, so they you, may that's root something you've, see, you've seen before yes, cause problems. Yes, it is. And um, Suzanne, explain what the ambrosia, why the ambrosia beetle causes a problem. Well, it, it drills in the thing and then eats, but it also has a blue stain fungus that grows in the plant. That's what's called the ambrosia. It, yeah, and that's what, you know, that's And what then it introduces it. that fungus yeah. because the babies eat it, don't they? Yeah, I think so. That's what the babies eat. But it can think. interfere with the vascular system of the plant. Yeah, and that's why the plant just collapses. Um, he may have, I, I've not seen a, you know, root rot of some. I was going to ask you. Yeah, root I, rot. I haven't either, but I mean, it's but, Possible it's possible to have, you know, any tree, any tree or plant can get root rot, and since he's lost two or three That's what more I was now, thinking. I'm thinking it may be a root rotting organism. So you probably need to dig in the soil and look at those roots and see if they're good and light colored, and if they're dark, and you can kind of um, get the root and kind of slither it off. Um, it may be root rot because um, that can actually move and yeah, it stays. So, it, so because um, you know, and he replaced one, yeah. and I believe that. Um, let Conway, that you could um, take a sample of that. Call the Extension Office. George Dickett there is a wonderful agent. He would be more than happy to help you. And take a sample of the root tissue, and you could send it to the Clemson lab. And um, look, as as Gerald said, look for the ambrosia beetle damage. Right. But you you can send samples to a lab um, at Clemson, and they will help you identify it. The sad thing is we don't have anything cure, to cure, cure that ambrosia. root rot. Yeah, or root rot either. Well, but the root rot he could plant in another area. Yes. Yeah. And, right. and, just, and that would tell him not to raise his plants area. up. Make sure they're planted real shallow. I mean, very shallow above the the soil line, and just kind of mound up to them. Maybe. And that's a native plant that usually doesn't have to. I know. To it's such I've a never, beautiful plant. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm suspicious of ambrosia beetle. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. Oh, they can give us a fit because they're uh, one of the ambrosia beetles, of course, is responsible for all the red base dying, too. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things out there that give us trouble. But Elaine is calling us from Mount Pleasant. And Elaine, um, I guess you've got some trouble. You wouldn't be calling us, but we sure hope we can help you with it. How can we help you? Well, I have a gardenia issue as well. Um, back during the cold, the most severe cold we had, all of the leaves on my gardenia bush turned brown. Really? And I was told, well, it's the first year it's ever happened. I mean, it's lived through every winter, and it's probably 12 or 14 years old. But um, I was told I probably ought to just chop it down, but then it started putting out some leaves, uh -huh. but the leaves will turn brown. I put out green leaves, and then after a while, those leaves are turning brown. Is there anything I can do to save this bush? I did fertilize it 
with uh, some azalea fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So well, what can I do to yeah, save it, to, or do you I think I can? Yeah, I wouldn't try to stimulate it. Um, yeah, mine died, too. Mine, I literally had to cut. So, Elaine, I had to cut mine entirely back, and it's not even coming out very well. But, of course, I'm a lot colder than in Mount Pleasant. Certainly. But I, I'm What about the nursery, Gerald? Uh, um, we did okay. A lot of gardenias did get damaged, but most of them are coming out. But now it could have been... It could have been the cold. Um, now, if there's a lot of white fly activity in the fall, it will make the leaves a lot more susceptible to cold damage. Uh, but if, the, um, if some varieties just don't take it. Ted and I have always learned that if you plant a gardenia where it does not get morning sun in the wintertime, that it's much cold, more, more cold resistant. And here's why. If it's 20 degrees and it, the sun hits it first thing, it'll fall it too quickly and burst the bark. Oh. So we do that with a lot of tender plants. So a lot but of people it, think that they want the plants yes. to get that morning sun. They think it's going to help them, but actually um, it's, it's not. It can, it, it can it damage can the bark. Detrimental, yes. So we put it on the west side or the north side, mm -hmm. and that way it's thawed out before the sun hits uh -huh. it. And um, it could be that. Now, I'm not positive that's what it is, but it with it especially trying to put out again and then turning brown. It may be just that cold damage. And you know, and may sometimes, you know. It may have damaged that bud in yeah, there, right. the leaf bud is what it may have damaged. Or cracked the bark. I mean, so, you know, if you, if you, you know, fall is the best time to replace things, I think. Right. And so if you want to, you know, if it, you have, might have sentimental value and you may just be real happy with it. And if you want to give it a chance, there's no reason not to give it a chance and just wait. But I'm afraid we can't give you any advice on anything. But I would not try to um, stimulate it with fertilizer or anything. I just yet. make sure, mm -hmm. I would just kind of let it percolate along and not try to force it into a lot of active growth. Um, we are going, we're so excited with these beautiful plants that you brought up that I just can't stand it. I'm going to have to go over and talk to you about them. So we're going to do the side count a little bit early tonight. And um, that means we're we're going to go back over to Jolie and see if people followed her directions and are actually in the chat room. Miss Jolie Elizabeth Brown, give me the results. Well, Amanda, we have 14 people in the chat room right now and seven viewers. So we're having some good discussions about tomatoes and peaches and bees, all kind of great questions and discussion. Um, if you'd like to join us, again, it's easy to do. Go to the Making It Grow Facebook page, click Let's Talk and sign in using your Facebook account or Rumble Talk. And I look forward to seeing you in the chat room. Um, an exciting and beautiful picture on the Facebook page was posted by Teresa earlier this week. It's a beautiful day lily. And she asked, what is your favorite variety? And I have a few of my favorites, but um, there are beautiful pictures on here, lots of great variety. So if you'd like to look on our Facebook page and enjoy the pictures. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you. And although, Jolie, we're so happy to have you with us, and I want everybody to know that um, Teresa will be back next week. And for those of you who are face making Grow Facebook bands, Teresa does a fabulous job um, with new information and images there. We really do appreciate her, and we hope she's having a good night off. We're so glad that we got you out of Trenton or North Augusta. North Augusta. Y'all got those little towns all over the place, Gerald. I can't <laughs> keep them straight. But of course, um, Gerald Stevens is um, one of the owners of the Nurseries Caroliniana, and they are known for wonderful plants if you just want traditional plants, but if we want something unusual, we've we're got both. Come see you. <laughs> and now this just looks like a big green plant. Well, I need really need Ted here because he can pronounce the names better. Oh, we're not he knows about the that. okay. <laughs> you just we'll, do your best. We'll make it. Um, this is a new one Ted found. Uh, I mean, he didn't find it, but he brought, brought it back. It yeah. Um, and uh, it's called Rhodolia. Rhodolia. Henry I. Henry I. And this one is Scarlet Bells. Scarlet uh, Bells. And we have a picture of it right there. Oh my gracious! Uh, it blooms in. Uh, Late January, early February. That it's, early? Yes. Really? Uh, it's going to make a small tree, probably 15 to 20 feet. How it can beautiful. take part sun to full sun. Uh -huh. And it's evergreen. evergreen. And that's just really neat. Uh-huh. Uh, it's got a real glossy, nice foliage. Um, it went through a hard winter. We left it out through the whole part of the really cold, below 10 degrees. And did uh, just And it did fine. It, Got a little burn in some yeah. places, Rotolia. and some of the foliage we see now is still showing that, but yeah. it's really a nice plant, brand new. Well, uh, and I we think something it. that has flowers that time of year 
can help you through yes. those long days oh, when yes. we just it all really said, can. when will spring come? Well, now this little fella at first I thought was a clay arrow, but, um, but then I looked at it a little more closely and tell me who that is exactly. It really does look like a clay arrow uh -huh. with the foliage, but uh, it's a Alessium or uh, anise. Oh, that wonderful uh, fragrance. Alessium anisatum. Uh -huh. uh, this one called purple glaze. But the new growth is really, really brilliant. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's and glaze, more brilliant you're in right. the sunlight. I mean, the, it looks like it was shine or shoe Yes, it does. Right? And we've got one at the retail that's probably about 10 feet tall, and it's just loaded with this purple foliage. Gosh. Just beautiful. It so really it makes a nice. wonderful, nice size, just like yes. the regular ones. And then you sacrificed one of the leaves, and we were yes, it very smells thrilled really to see really that good. you. Um, you know, I think everybody needs one in their yard to take. Just to when, walk around and crush that well, foliage. Well, when the children come. Take you, I mean, my, whenever I do that, I think, I think of Mama, because she did that with me, and I bet your right. Mama did it with you. Yep. It, it's a wonderful but, way for us to no, make memories. No, Ted did it with me. Ted did it with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, my Mama um, I take it he's the older brother. Yeah, he okay. is. He well, is. and then this is um, entirely different, but it, it looks kind of like a little orchid, but how much trouble yeah. is it? It's not any trouble. It's, um, it's a little ground orchid. needs part sun to shade, um, but it it's perennial, oh. uh, and it it kind of clusters, uh, it kind of suckers up. Uh, it's really a nice little plant. We have another one uh, that's a bluish purple foliage, I mean bluish purple flower, and it has a white edge on it. It's got a variegated okay. white uh -huh. edge on it. It's so, really neat. And it, so it's not terribly slow. In a couple of years you'd have a nice little clump right, right out the right. yard. Right. Okay. It's not going to be a tight clump. Oh, it's going to yeah. kind of sucker out a little bit, but it's really Graceful. neat. Graceful. Yes. Okay. And um, <laughs> this is such a curious little thing. I was looking at the opposite of the alternate. Yep, and good I'm, for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually a true boxwood, uh -huh. uh, not a holly, uh, but it's a boxwood. It's a very compact little boxwood called Grace Hendrix Phillips. It's just really one of my favorite um, landscape plants because it stays so compact. I'm saying 12 to 18 inches, probably maybe a little bit larger. Uh, it can take full sun oh. if it's watered enough uh -huh. uh, to a fair amount of shade, but it's just a really neat little uh, so compact, and, little and it hugs the ground. I call it like a wart. It, it, it is, it, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, it, it uh -huh. doesn't come up on a stem mm -hmm. like a lot mm -hmm. of plants. It stays real low to the ground and just so is really nice. So for a little knot nice. garden or one of those yes, special or, gardens, yes. it would be perfect, right, wouldn't it? Right. And it's Grace Hendrick. Phillips. We'll right. have to find out more about her. Yeah, we, we like, need we to like know her. Who she is. We like yeah, what we she's do. got here. And right. um, I don't know about this. <laughs> okay. We all were overdone with Burford holly uh -huh. when we were young, and um, that was one of the first uh, Chinese hollies that came out. But this one is Sunny Burford, and um, and it's really got a great, it great does have foliage, a great color, doesn't um, it? Yeah. and holds it really well if it's in full sun. Mm -hmm. But that's important that it needs sun. Um, but it's, and it looks uh, like the new leaves, I guess. But where I'm looking, Jared, it looks like the older leaves um, will keep some of that color. It does. Then, it keeps so it's it really well. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And now, it has really nice red berries too. Uh uh So that would Are be a kidding? real good contrast. Gosh, At that Christmas, be I took my uh, snuck some cuttings from Ted's plants and took them to the house and uh, and with red berries and this foliage is really, really nice. So. Wonderful for decorating and yep. just for brightening a corner of the yard. Right. And again, we'll get pretty big. Right. But you could handle it. You could keep sure. it down, but uh -huh. it is going to want to get some size to it. Well, I think with something that's pretty, you want it to have some size, don't you? Right. Yeah. And then, um, oh, I just love red hot pokers. Yep. And, um, you said this one has um, some unusual aspects to it. It is a repeat bloomer. And uh, so it's really nice in that. Uh, at last year, at um, in November, it was loaded with these fluorescent orange um, foliage. I mean, flowers and just loaded, and it was just really stunning. In November. In November, but it kind of repeats uh -huh. off and on. Doesn't bloom mm -hmm. solid, but mm -hmm. just kind of keeps coming back with flowers. Uh, but it's a really neat nifo. We've got several. We've got a yellow nifofia. We've got several varieties of this one. I forget what this one is. Um, it's uh, Echo Rojo. Oh, Echo, because it keeps, yeah, right. boing, 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 Rojo. Boing, yeah, but Rojo. that's really okay. nice, right. yeah. And then, um, what a beautiful little collection of, I guess, of the miniature Solomon seal. Right, um, polygonatums, uh, and it's just a good variety there. The, um, the one in the, 
back here is just a, the, one of the original uh, variegated forms. And then we've got um, two Look other variegations that are different mm -hmm. variegations. And you see the different, how bright that variegation yes. is on that new one. Uh, they're Japanese names, so I can't pronounce them all. <laughs> and then we've got the red stem one right here, Beautiful. which is really neat. And you see how it's suckering out of the I can. Sure do. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's and they do, they, they won't take over, but they no. will, with good care, part shade, would you say? Part shade uh, to shade. Soil. And they just kind of wander out mm -hmm. and make a real nice little display. They're not invasive no, but no. they're just really nice and I have enough now that I feel like what I'm doing a special flower arrangement I can cut a few stems and they for a small flower arrangement they add tremendous interest and they, they hold really up very do. well when they're cut for people who right. like to use cut flowers right. or cut, right. cut foliage in this there you case go. and talk about some foliage now everybody's been out here saying is that a flower does it smell good da, 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 what? and then they stick their nose in it and they come back <laughs> right that one will bite you <laughs> Um, that is a Ponsiris. Uh, it's a, a citrus. Uh, it has the little lemon orange or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's edible, but it's not, you don't want to eat it. It's, it's the so one that, the, the large version of this is in all of our old, old established yes, yards, right. I think. They used them for fences to keep people out. I think. <laughs> the Gusta National, I think, has got them all around it, so you don't, <laughs> you don't go through that. But this one is a contorted variety. Uh -huh. If you can see real close, there's some real contortions in the thorns. Mm -hmm. And I always call it a, a parachutist nightmare. Ooh -wee. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, this one is a, we, the original one is called Flying Dragon, and it's just green foliage. But this one has this really rich variegated foliage, and it's cold hardy. Uh, and but it's just real stunning the foliage on that is. It's it is just truly, really truly yeah. beautiful. And I guess it's pretty hardy. The ones I've known. I it mean, is. It's very exposure, hardy. Exposure, sun, or right. Uh, or full this sun. One, this one can take full sun. It would that. prefer full sun because it'll keep the foliage really? better. Okay. Right. So. And then over in front of our dear little friend in the chat room, we've got a charmer, and you said it's got some oh, special this characteristics. Oh, this is one of my favorite. Um, it's a little hosta. Um, Cabotan, I believe it's Cabotan. Um, but uh, the neat thing about it, Ted said he had it and he couldn't make it propagate well. It wouldn't divide good. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so he can do it. Yeah, and he's got a thumb more than green. And so he finally just kind of threw it aside and it was in full sun where he threw it and it just started thriving. No. So he knows now that it likes full sun. My goodness. Uh, if you've got wa enough water. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just really does well. And it's so small and compact, it almost looks like a, 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 a liripe or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a true hosta, and it's just really a neat plant. So people uh -huh. could use that on patios and places um, in little pots and all because it right. wouldn't overtake anything. We just right, and then it. Well, I wouldn't mind if that overtook me, but it's not, it's just going, yeah. it stays just a clump and it just okay. grabs the clump right. sound. Well, this has been a real treat um, for you to bring such wonderful things and share with us some of the treasures y'all well, have you. at Nurseries Carolina. Thank you for making the trip. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. And now we're going to check back in with Charlie and find out, oh, goodness, if people are getting, think, think things are looking good in the world of tomatoes or if they think there's some problems. Jolie? Well, Amanda, we've had a few that have already had some fried green tomatoes, which I enjoy those. Um, so far, we have 20 speakers and 10 viewers. Please note, as a viewer, you won't be able to ask your questions, so we'd love for you to become a speaker. Um, we have lots of great discussion going on about the summer vegetable gardens. And um, for more information, you can check out HGIC fact sheets. Speaking of summer, I know that a lot of parents are excited about their kids being out of school and anxious to find some fun educational um, programs for them to enjoy during the summer. If you would like to, please check out the Clemson calendar and there you will find some great 4-H programs this summer, including day camps and overnight camp. Also, we have several 4-H 2-O camps going on across the state. Um, this is a partnership between Carolina Clear and 4-H, and kids can learn in a fun, interactive way about water quality and our environment. So please check out the Clemson calendar. Back to you.
you, Amanda. And Jolie, I'm imagining that you're going to have some camp down there, um, down your way. And if you, an easy way to, um, if you're within a county and you want to find out, just put Clemson Extension Sumter County or Clemson Extension Williamsburg County, and then that'll take you directly to that site. It's easy to search and find things that way. And we've got a lot of great programs for children this summer. Um, I hope you'll take advantage of them if you've got some young people at your house. Um, Pat's calling us from Hartsville. Pat, we sure are glad to hear from you. And how can we help you with what's going on up your way? Yes, hi Amanda. This year we have dry patches in our centipede lawn and I was just wondering if I've seen a lot of lawns around in Hartsville that has looks the same way. And I was just wondering if you have any idea what that might be. Um well Suzanne comes and teaches turf for my master gardeners and large patch is something they talk about a lot. And Tony and everybody tells me they're seeing a huge amount of that this year. We've got, you know, I think Can we have a combination of large patch, which we used to call brown patch, uh -huh. but now on warm season grasses they call it large patch. And we also have some winter kill. And so I, she could have one or the other or both going on at the same time. And large patch, Amanda, actually um, it, the spores get on the grass in the fall. Mm -hmm. And then in the spring, you notice that the, it starts dying out. Oh, you and, notice that it died. You notice yeah. that uh -huh. If you actually went out there and looked, you could actually see it happening in the fall. But most nobody of the time, nobody, nobody really goes and looks at their yard that well in the fall. So the time to spray for it, a fungicide is in the fall. And also, watch that summer water. And people were there. We rarely see it in yards that, don't have, that not, don't have irrigation, but if the yard's irrigated, we see it a lot. So, And then also, because of that cold weather we had, it got down to you know, 10, 10, 15 degrees, and we have winter, we have winter damage well, out Suzanne, there, Well, Suzanne, since centipede is, is kind of slow, do you think that Pat could get some centipede and try to plug in and yeah, fill yeah. in some? Yeah, would you think that would help? Yeah, tell her um, she needs to top dress it a little bit. I found and um, centipede likes to grow uphill and not downhill. <laughs> and so if you'll top dress it a little what bit. A peculiar <laughs> I know, that, that we all want to go downhill, but centipede wants to go uphill. So if she'll top dress it with, with some peat moss, sand, like a golf course mix, or either organic matter even is better, any okay. kind of mushroom compost, chicken okay. compost, right. something like that, black cow. Top um, dress. Top dress, and then she can can um, plug, you know, she can plug, plug. it or, or, or either, some people try reseeding it. It's kind of difficult, but you can reseed it and sometimes. And rather too. than turn the irrigation system, and if she does that, she should just water the area that has yeah. the sprigs in it and mm -hmm. wait and, and how much water does centipede usually need a week? Well, centipede needs, depending on whether it's sand or clay, inch to an inch and a half a week. Okay. So, but not everyday water. But not everyday water. No. Um, you know, twice a week will be of sufficient till we get 100 degree days, degree days in July, and then we might do three times a week, but usually twice a week is okay. sufficient. Well, so. thank you, because I think I, a lot I of people I will say Saint, people with St. Augustine may also see some winter kill, too. Not so much Zoysia and Bermuda, but St. Augustine and, and Centipede. They're yeah. a little more cold. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit more Aren't cold. Aren't you glad that you don't have to worry about, you don't have a big, great big lawn, do you? No, I have a little tiny lawn. Isn't that perfect? Yeah. <laughs> it's almost shaded out, but it's still there. <laughs> with all these wonderful plants, I declare. Uh, well, right now, I think we're going to check in with our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina, and um, that would be Dr. John Nelson himself, who, when he was a little boy, was called J.B. I just <laughs> learned that about him. And, um, and I'm, I was called Mandy, so I guess we all have those little pet names from childhood. But we're going to call you Dr. John. How about that? And what have you got for us tonight? Well, Amanda, there are no secrets with you, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was lucky enough last uh, week, one day I was able to go up and visit my good friend, uh, Dr. Jim Kibler, who lives up there in uh, northern Newberry County near the banks of the mighty Tiger River. And uh, we went on a field trip uh, in the uh, woodsy portion of his property. And there's a really, really wonderful vine that we saw, a blooming vine that everybody should know about. It's a very common vine. It's all over South Carolina and just about all over North Carolina. Uh, and it's deciduous. So in the wintertime, you don't see its leaves. They're, the leaves now are very tender, but very attractive. And uh, this vine, well, it's got opposite leaves. This vine will grow way up high into trees. It loves uh, swampy woods, or it also tolerates um, upland woods as well, so it can be found in a variety of habitats. 
And its uh, flowers are really wonderful. They look like, um, I don't know what they look like. They look like miniature starfish or something. And uh, they are very, very fragrant. They're just as sweet as they can be. And uh, lots of stamens and lots of uh, tiny little petals underneath the stamens. And um, this plant, after it loses its leaves in the winter, it will have little tiny, tiny seed pods um, where the flowers used to be. And each little seed pod will rot away. And it looks like a, in a very curious way, it looks sort of like a tiny little bird cage. Oh. And, um, you know, this is a common plant. And um, the, the crazy thing about this is that I've never seen it in cultivation. But I think it would be wonderful to grow up a... Um, a, uh, a trellis or something, um, just beautiful stuff. Well, um, we actually have a lot of it here in Swan Lake Hours Gardens because we have those cypress swamps and it just does beautifully. And I think y'all know what it is. <laughs> is it a schizophrenia? Well, it would be considered kind of in the same family, right. I think. Um, I, Suzanne, I call it decumeria. Is that? Well, I have heard of Dick Is I that know. correct, John? Well, of course, Amanda, you're right. Yeah. I was going to say, it's climbing hydrangea is well, a common name. I is think that, that is a yeah. common, yeah, yeah. Cl climbing hydrangea. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that um, the botanists, as they're, uh, they, you know, we're always classifying these plants in different ways. It's looking more and more like this plant really deserves to be considered a species of hydrangea. So, oh, do y'all carry it? No, we don't. We've, uh, we've got some schizophragmas and some other. Well, and um, John, if I might say, um, this plant to me, when I walk in Sumter's beautiful Swan Lake Iris Gardens, which are open, I think, every day of the year, maybe not Christmas, um, and we go on those boardwalks and walk around them um, in the fall, this plant turns the most beautiful yellow. The leaves almost, t Gerald, they're almost as lemony as the leaves on, on that, that little holly, uh huh, right. and and kind of translucent. And I'm sure, John, you've probably seen it when it's doing that. But that's one of my favorite aspects of it. You know, people like things that are evergreen, but when things change in the fall so beautifully, um, I think that's. A, I've got it case. in my woods, and it is absolutely stunning. It is beautiful. It really is, John. That and I'm gonna, now I'm going to have to go look at the bird little bird cages, the rotting <laughs> seeds. <laughs> I haven't seen that now. <laughs> well, you know, John looks at things so curiously, and actually, uh -huh. I have not smelled it because it's kind of high up in the tree. But uh -huh. uh, maybe I'll take a little step ladder over to Swan Lake and tomorrow and try to stick my nose in some. I'm so yeah. glad you brought that beautiful plant, and I have seen native nurseries that offer that plant, John, and I think you have um, really given us um, a good reason to look into um, bringing that lovely little plant. And I, I'm not mistaken, I think that it's very um, heavily utilized by bees when it's in flower. Probably is. I think that right. some of the beekeepers have told me that, which is, of course, another reason. Well, you sure gave us a treat, John, and I'm sure you had a good time with Jim Kibler. Um, he sounds like such a nice man, and I'm looking forward to meeting him. And he's going to be giving a talk on the old Pomeria Nursery at the McKissick Museum in um, about 10 to, in a little over two weeks, maybe, John? That's right. I think it's on the 18th, and um, I've got, that reminds me, i got a, um, I got a bunch of stuff to do tomorrow to help put that um, exhibit together. Okay, so. and I'll try to get some information on that exhibit and um, present it next week, and we'll put it on our Facebook page for people who'd be interested in learning about the very nationally, very important Pomeria nursery that used to be up in Newberry. John, thank you so much, and we will look forward to being with you next week. Well, thank you, Amanda, and I look forward to being here as well. Okay. Um, this is fun because we were just talking about Beach Island today. You know, Jinx Farmer has that wonderful new book out that we're all reading. And um, he lives at Beach Island. And Margaret's calling us from Beach Island. Margaret, thank you for giving us a call. And when my mama was a little girl, she spent a lot of time over there. And why is it called Beach Island, Margaret? Well, that's a long history story. The Indians know, yeah, years and years ago. Uh -huh. But well, my question for you tonight, what can I do to get rid of nut grass if taken over my garden? Oh, my goodness. Is this your vegetable garden? 
Yes, ma'am. The vegetable garden. I am so sorry. Tony was here yesterday talking to us, and he said um, that um, that a pig will do it. And I said, Tony, I can't let a pig go in my vegetable garden. I have it too, Margaret. Um, That's the, what my dad always said. Let the hogs loose in it. Yeah. That'll get rid of it. But, I, but you, well, you know, that was that the old days. The the, the, the either of you does either of you have a? I, my suggestion would be to abandon it for this season and and hit it with uh, nut, I mean not nuts, sedge hammer, sedge hammer. which is a herbicide. a herbicide that will kill nut grass and try to wipe it out and then come back to it the next yeah. year because I don't think you're going to be able to get rid of it. And with she the, can't use that product in a vegetable no. garden, yeah. the vegetable, so we need to clarify that. But Yes, like abandon said, it for a year and spray it real good with the nuts, uh, the sedge hammer. And I don't know, know any other way well, other and, than letting the hogs in on yeah, it. And one thing I've done is I mulch my garden so heavily with coastal Bermuda hay that I can cool. pull. And I must admit it comes back, but because the ground is so soft, I kind of I feel like I kind of keep ahead of it. Right. So there's sev sometimes there are good reasons to mulch a vegetable garden. And you know, in between where I don't have the vegetables, um, I use that wonderful technique that people like Margot Rochester and all um, of you know, putting down newspaper. newspaper. Right. I mean, don't you think mm -hmm. sometimes we can get that a little will, bit of that help? That grass will come, come through a lot of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it would come through newspaper or yeah. not. But, but I mean, it might help through. her get through this year. It might. And then it she might. could um, mm -hmm. try to get a new spot. If she's on Beach Island, she may be out in the country and have a little bit larger landscape than right. some of these little teeny tiny city lots. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, well, Millie's calling us from one of our favorite places in South Carolina, and that is Lake City. Hey, Millie, how are you? I'm oh, fine. How are you? We're good. And what's happening that we can help you with? Well, I just have a comment or just an encouragement to anyone that have a gardenia bush and thought they had lost it to the freeze that we had. Uh -huh. um, I also thought the same thing. And I was outside just strolling around in my garden, and I looked at it, and I, it's full of um, buds to bloom. It's late, but it's still getting ready to bloom. So. I just want to encourage anyone, don't cut your bush off back yet. Um, you might get some flowers after all. Well, thank you so much, and I hope that you'll be able to cut some and bring them inside where you can enjoy them, and we are happy for that, um, for, the, for the happy ending to your story. Thank you. All righty. The same okay. with our psycho palms, too. Don't, don't give don't up. Don't give up. Okay. Some of them, I think yours spit the dust, Mine, didn't it? Mine's in the bush. I've heard but, that sometimes oh, it can uh, take months and months and months, about as long as to have a baby for them to recover from it. <laughs> really bad But weather. a lot of them are coming out really yeah. well, yeah. but a lot of them are biting dust yeah. too. Okay. It was a tough year for those. For those. Um, but one thing that, um, that didn't have a tough year was the beautiful landscape around the horticulture um, department at Trident Technical College. And we went down there and had a wonderful time visiting with Tony Bertowski and learning about the program they've got there that has um, quite an interesting array of students in it. I'm visiting with Tony Bertowski. Tony is the head of the horticulture department at Trident Technical College in Charleston, South Carolina. Tony, y'all have a diverse program, what are you trying to expose the students here to and prepare them for? Well, a lot of uh, students come here interested in plants, and what they find out is there's a lot more than just plants. So they get a good exposure to building everything that's around here. Um, we've got everything from furniture to paved areas. Uh, we've got a small golf green. We grow food, um, as well as planting and taking care of shrubs and a greenhouse where they're growing everything and preparing it all up to the point where something could be sold. I think one of the things I like as I've walked around here is that you've got a wonderful collection of plants and it looks like you've really focused on ones that do well and I think that so you must be pushing that right plant right place because you also do teach design don't you? Absolutely and that's the great thing about something like this is that this is kind of a living laboratory that's around our area so we get a chance to plant a lot of different things and when I say we the students get a chance to put these in the ground see how they do there's no mistakes here so a lot of times we'll put in new stuff and it doesn't do well or we'll put something where um, it has a chance to flourish um, so they see how things are doing here and how they can integrate them into a class like landscape design. 
We know that sustainability is what everybody's so excited about, and I think that's something that y'all are trying to give kids ideas about while they're here. Well, um, in the last uh, three or four years, we started a sustainability program, and it involves a class, and what's really fun about this is that some of the newer technologies, green roofs, green walls, um, rainwater harvesting, permeable paving. We don't even we don't just talk about all those things, but they're able to install these things. We've got some areas around here where we get to see um, how green roofs are being uh, constructed and how well they do. Um, one of the exciting things is is we've got uh, up to 7,000 gallons we collect off the greenhouse, and we use that water. Um, we could use it to water plants, but we also use it to recycle and and cool the greenhouse. So we're reusing a lot of the uh, elements that um, are oftentimes just trying to we're trying to manage to get rid of. We are seeing and talking to a lot of people who seem interested in changing lifestyles halfway through. Do you have both young and older people involved? Oh, absolutely. In fact, one of the things we're trying to do is recruit more people out of high school, believe it or not, because the majority of our students are people that are non-traditional in their 20s, their 30s, even people that um, are, are thinking of a career change, or they've always loved to do this, they just want to know more. So we have a tremendously diverse uh, student population in our program, um, which makes it a lot of fun and it makes it easy to learn because uh, these students bring as much to the classes as the instructors do. Well. You said it, if people want to know more, what is the best way to find out about the program and get in touch with you? Well, if they want to know more about the program, um, the best way to go is go to our website, tridenttech.edu. Um, if they're really interested in taking classes here, getting into our horticulture program, they can call me at 843-574-6278. Tony, thank you for letting us visit you and thank you for arranging such a beautiful day in South Carolina. You're very welcome. Um, Tony Bortaski is truly a wonderful teacher. He's passionate and enthusiastic and has a great deal of affection for his students and um, came up with a couple of them not long ago on the show. And they're having good careers. Um, I would encourage people who um, would like to learn more about the joys of gardening to um, look into the wonderful program that they've got there at Trident Technical College. Um, well, Suzanne, I was up, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, what's I'm going to do for my hat? And there were actually some flowers in the garden. And yeah, I can smell one of them too. <laughs> <laughs> so will you please take them? <laughs> well, um, let's see. Let's, I'm trying to look in the mirror. This, put your, you put your hand on it. This, yeah. this is the one I smell. So yeah, because it's the, garlic. Yeah, elephant, elephant, yeah, elephant garlic. garlic. Yeah. But it's beautiful. The, the mm -hmm. stems it come is. around and fall and woo and wind around. And, um, and then those wonderful um, Asiatic lilies that are mm. inexpensive, inexpensive, but it's a, uh, such a good color. And they keep coming back you, and yeah. getting better. Yeah. That's what's so yeah. neat about it. It's orange, too. I yeah. mean, how better can you get? I know. I know. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, well, what you've got it tied up with is the interesting thing. Well, uh, smile is always right, the base smiley, of smiley. <laughs> But it doesn't have any thorns on it. That's so, it. Thank you know, goodness I got one of those nicer smile -X. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, Al's up in Simpsonville, and we're glad to hear from you tonight, Al. What's happening that we might be able to give you some advice for? I'm having problems with plum trees, fungus coming on my plums, uh -huh. and just eat them right up. That's done happen about three years straight. Now, does it look like kind of a jelly that's getting on them? Uh, yeah, like a kind of a, uh, like a, like ash or something, like a ash, fungus-like. On the, on the, tr on the fruit or on the tree itself? On the, on the plum itself. On the plum itself, an ash. Hmm. It's just a fruit rod. I don't know what to do uh -huh. other than continuously spraying with uh, fruit tree spray. I don't know what else to do. And talk um, about those home orchard sprays that yeah, the could be used. The home orchard spray has a fungicide and an insecticide, mm. usually captanamylophon. malafon. Right. And would you have to spray them every 10 days, 14 days, yes. isn't that on the label? Mm -hmm. Every 10 to 14 and days. And I'm going to be frank with you. There are very few homeowners that I've ever seen to have good fruit on plums and peaches. It's just not easy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we leave it to the people in, in okay. Edgefield, Trenton, Johnson, Spartanburg <laughs> yeah. area. To, to well, roll and with. yeah, and, and, and it is true. We have some backyard fruits that are easy, but plums yeah. and peaches are, are very difficult, and yeah. um, it's hard 
to spray them because you don't, we don't have the right equipment. But if you want to, but you must be very careful not to use a home orchard spray when the flowers are present because you'll kill the bees. Right. But, um, but get, if you would like to read about it and find out, but you have to follow the labels very carefully because, of course, this is something you're going to eat. But, Suzanne, sometimes we have people who are eating in our garden, not people, but creatures in our garden that are eating that are just horrible. And I cannot believe what you brought. This well, is the most Gerald, horrible. Is it? But, but probably oh, in my really? yard. He probably got it out of my yard. <laughs> so. Gerald, what no, in I the did. world happened here? Well, this was now a hold bush. Hold it real still so we can get a good picture um, of it. This is was, was a bush about six, eight feet tall, and all of a sudden a customer brought it in and said it just flopped over, and they pulled it up and there were no roots on it. And if you can see that, all the, the roots have been chewed off in just nice little even, uh, I mean, he did a great job on it. Had a good set um, of choppers, didn't he? Right. Uh, this is vole damage, mm. not M-O-L-E, but V-O-L-E mm -hmm. damage. And they are, they colonize, and there can be hundreds, hundreds in, a, in their little mice about, or look like tiny a mice. I don't call them a shrew. They're more yeah. like a shrew. Yeah, they're little, tiny little things. I have a little short tail, usually brown with a kind of a snout. You can hardly see their eyes if you can see them. Uh, but they are ferocious, and they eat. Um, we've even seen them eat hickory trees, huge hickory yeah. trees, and kill them. Um, um, Andy Rollins had a good um, device that he just demonstrated one time. I'll ask him to share that with us. But um, Clemson has a there's a fact sheet on voles and moles, but they are difficult to deal with. A but, female and, cat <laughs> that has been fixed the day you put her out there and leave her outdoors is the best. And, and you know, <laughs> I didn't have them until my cat got. 16, 17, 18 years old, and, now, and they have overtaken my garden. I'm going to make me a mint coat out of all the ones I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay. Well, James is calling us from Peely in South Carolina. James, thank you for calling us tonight. How can we help you? How do you get rid of hemp bit? A pen bit? Yeah, I, I dug them up. Okay, all right. Okay. I dug them up. I used that part of a hammer to core. Okay, thank you for that question because actually henbit is one we have a fact sheet on and it's pretty easy if you use a pre emergent. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. And what's the secret to pre emergent? Remembering to put it out. Yeah. Get it out yeah. soon enough. Get it out in uh, early October. Mm -hmm. Early and, October. Right. Even late September. Mm -hmm. Don't get it out too early or you will it'll wear out before mm -hmm. it's useful but and sometimes they recommend two applications 90 right. days and so, you know again in january or late december oh, yeah right mm -hmm. but get it out very you know early but not too early and a pre-emergent is um you put out um and it keeps the seeds from germinating and you have to follow the directions to the to the T. Sometimes you have to irrigate it and things like that when you put it out. But hen bit is one that, with some persistence, I think you'll be able to. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that, yeah, getting it out early. You right. can't wait till it comes up. Jolie, um, we really appreciate your um, staying over here in Sumter and helping us tonight. It was a joy to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Amanda. I always enjoy filling in for Teresa, and we've had a great chat room tonight. Um, lots of good questions, and thank you to Teresa for being in the chat room with me. It gets a little hectic in here, so I really appreciate your help answering the questions. And we've had a lot of likes on the Making It Grow Facebook page. I know some folks wanted to post pictures in the chat room to try and answer questions. There's not a way to do that, but you are welcome to post your pictures on the Making It Grow Facebook page where Teresa and Amanda can help answer your questions and identify your plants. Thank you. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you, and I hope that you get a good turnout for your cleanup. And if people want to know, help Jolie with her cleanup here in Sumter, just call the Sumter Extension Office, and we'll be glad to give you all that information. Gerald, thank you so very, very much for coming. This was a real joy to have well, you I've with enjoyed us. it, too. And um, if people want to find out how to make their way to your nursery in that sandy part of the world, right. what's the best way to do that? Well, go to our website, uh, okay. NURCAR. NURCAR. Yes, NURCAR. N-U-R-C-A-R. -R. -R -R. Right. Nurseries Caroliniana, but the first three letters of both words, okay. NUR, N-U-R, and C-A-R is the All best right. way. Okay. Dot com. And that way you, you can get real good directions. We're at exit 5 on I-20, right at the South Carolina-Georgia line. Uh, and 
Just and we follow can find those it directions. if you follow those directions. Yes, then you go. found it. I did, I, and I'm not the best person at following directions. But because I, you found and it And once I times. found it, I wanted to come back a lot because right. it's a wonderful place to visit, and you well, have a wonderful you. family that's helping you there. And give Ted our dearest love to you. I will. Okay. I sure Suzanne, will. we love it when you come up. I'm sorry you're not coming back to St. Matthew's to spend the night I with know. me tonight. I, I'm disappointed <laughs> now, Amanda. I don't get a good sleep. But you go home and go home and say hello to that. Um, and the Greenville Master Gardener is having is accepting applications for their new Master Gardener program. As you know from watching Corey Tanner, what a fabulous educator he is. And we encourage you to go to the Greenville County website and find out about that Master Gardener program there. And we will see you next week right here on Making It Grow. Night, night. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.